God bless you, Facebook family. How you doing? This is Robert Jenkins. Um, here we are again another day. We're going to go into some teaching today. I want to talk about developing a godly pathway. Developing a godly pathway. Again, I want to thank all those who've been listening, who's been tagging, who's been sharing it. Um, it's been a blessing to me. I appreciate all your comments. If you are listening live, please put your comments in. Even if you get a chance to watch it when it's not live, put your comments in. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, it's a blessing to me, and I want to be a blessing to you. I want to talk about developing godly pathways and um, how important that is and how we do that. So there's a lot of things that God has given me today. I wrote them down as usual, at least the, the subject of them, and then we'll talk about them. Um, this is a time when God wants to use us. God wants to trust us with trouble. Trouble is ministry. Ministry is a sacrifice. If you call to do a ministry, I hope you're not blinded by the good side because there is a work side that comes with ministry. There's a suffering side that comes with ministry. You have a call and your call is to endure people. And if you call to do a ministry, you probably need to go to college or take up a course on psychology because you got to deal with people's attitudes and their thought process and consciousness. Whether we know it or not, the whole point of theology is to help out psychology. It is the transformation of the mind. And we lead people from a consciousness of their own way of thinking and through a theology and how God thinks. Very key. So I want to talk about that and also how it relates to maturity, how it relates to growing up, how it relates to elevation, how it relates to forgiveness, how we see others. So important. There's a pathway in which God is trying to develop us to operate on, to live, to be, to work, to do. And we got to understand how to be developed in that pathway. You know, I talk about a lot. Uh, when a person is not safe, they have things that they can do in their life. They, they have things such as they can party. Um, they may drink. They may smoke. Um, they may have certain levels of friends. Well, when you give your life to God, you give up. And I, I should, I'm going to say it the honest way. You give all that up. Matter of fact, you give up your own will. You give up your own desires. For God's desire, you now delight yourself in Him. He becomes the main appetite of your heart. So it's so key, and my connection, I can see my connection is getting weak, so if it go off, just stay here and I'll come back. But it's so key that we understand how to be developed in God's pathway. How do God want me to act? How do God want me to be? How do I remain in God without losing any joy, without losing any uh, maturity? How do I stay mature? How do I grow in Christ? very key. So I want to talk about some things and hope that it'll be a blessing to you. The first thing I wrote down is what I just talked about. It's first principle is growing in God. Let me ask you a question. Are you growing in God? I'm not asking you, are you growing in church? I'm not asking you, are you growing in religion? I'm asking you, are you growing in God? Do you have a deeper commitment and loyalty to God now than you had a year ago, six months ago? Have you moved from some basic principles in God? Have you moved to a greater level? I use this as a natural example. Um, in school, your kids usually start off from pre-K and then it goes to kindergarten. And then it goes to elementary school, one through five now. Then you go to junior high, six through eight. And then you go to high school, usually nine through 12. And then you start over as a freshman, you go to college. And you learn different things. You learn how to read, you learn how to add, you learn how to multiply, subtract. Then you have different courses you have to take two, three years of math, so many years of science, and so many years of health, so that you can be a, a citizen of the United States and be able to operate at a certain level because you can read, you can write, you can understand, you can perceive, things like that. Well, what are the ABCs in God? And are you growing in those? Do you understand faith? Have you moved from faith to faith, from glory to glory? Do you understand justification? Do you understand sanctification? Do you understand redemption? Do you understand forgiveness? Do you understand forgiveness or repentance? Do you know the difference between the church and the body of Christ? Do you know the difference between your mind and the mind of Christ? Do you understand if somebody asks you a word like, what is an incorruptible seed? What is the incorruptible seed that lives in you? Do you understand the power of authority? Do you understand ecclesia? Do you even know what that means? Do you understand the power you've been given versus the authority in Matthew chapter 10 versus Acts 1 and 8? These are some things that you have to grow. Do you understand when 
The Bible refers to you as the salt of the earth or the light of the world. It may refer to you as the bride of Christ. It may refer to you as sons, those who are led by the Spirit, or sons of God. Do you understand these different symbolisms? You don't want to be a person that's victim of being in church all your life and never growing in God. Can you look at yourself and say, three years ago, there's some things that could happen to me that I held on for bitterness for years. I'm at a level now that you can offend me and I can forgive you in four days. Are you growing in God in your level of forgiveness? Can you say without a shadow of a doubt that now when I go through storms, I don't quit, I don't cry, I don't complain, but I know how to stay in the boat when it's full of water, trusting that God is on board, knowing without a shadow of a doubt that I'm going to make it to the other side. Do you know how to passionately now be a better father, a better mother? Have you grown in God when it comes to fatherhood? Have you grown in God when it comes to sonship? Have you grown in God when it comes to being a brother, a brother mother? Have you grown in God in your prayer life? Can you say that when you were younger, um, you only could pray five minutes and you didn't know what to say? But now you can pray a, a solid hour, a solid two hours, and without repeating myself and not being redundant and not being repetitious, but pray from the sincere of my heart that I can hear the voice of God. I know when God speaks. Have you grown in that level that you hear God with a more clarity now than you ever heard before? Have you grown in God? Because there's a pathway that God wants to lead you down. And you must develop yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to develop you. So when that pathway is chosen for you, you can walk down that pathway successful. Do you know how to have victory in your life? Do you know how to take authority over demons and principalities and powers? Do you know how to call those things as not as though they were? See, this is very key. And even though I'm very more calm today, more relaxed, can you enjoy a word without the emotional thrills to it? Can you hear from the preacher, from the teacher, from the Holy Ghost from within, without the dramatics of church, and still get a word from God? Are you excited about your morning when you wake up? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt what your purpose is on earth? What is your function? Are you clear about the vision that God has given you? Have you grown in God? Because these are things that God gives you when you first get saved or as you grow as a baby. But as you grow, your vision grows. Your understanding grows. Your maturity grows. Your attitude about life grows. Um, how you used to be complaining about a lot of things or upset about a lot of things or frustrated. Now you begin to see the purpose. Can you take a negative and make it a positive? Have you grown in God? There's a pathway that God has caused for you. And you must ask yourself those questions and answer those honestly. To be able to walk in the pathway that God has called for you, you will have to grow in God. You cannot stay immature. You cannot stay a baby. You cannot always allow for other people to be your uh, feeding source. You must get to the point that you know how to get into the word for yourself. You must get to the point that you can cast out your own demons. You must get to the point that you know how to handle trouble. You must get to the point that not only do you know how to be a blessing to yourself, but you can be a blessing to others. You must get to the point to know now that you don't always look for a voice from, from other people that God is speaking through, but now you can be used as a voice as well. You have to grow in God. Um, the devil will always be able to have you in captivity if you're not growing. And you have to know what growing is. You have to be able to articulate growth. And I'm going to talk about that today. So the first principle or the first thing you need to be developed in your life in order to walk the pathway that, that, that God wants us to walk. You know, Paul says something very key. He said, we walk according to the course of this world, even the children of disobedience. He said, there's a course in which you walked in. You have a natural DNA in the fallen conscience of Adam that made you, that taught you how to lie, that taught you how to hide, that taught you how to cover, that taught you how to blame, that taught you how to be selfish, that taught you how to use your ego and your pride to get what you want. Just like there's a natural lessons that come from the DNA of the fallen consciousness, there's a natural DNA or information or revelatory that comes from the DNA of Jesus Christ. Why was it so easy for you to grow in the natural? Easy to accept things, selfishness, bitterness, depression, in the natural, but when it comes to the spiritual DNA, you're the same place you was when you got saved. No, you must make a demand on that seed that's in you and say, I will grow in God. God waters, some will plant, some, but God adds the increase. You got to know every day that there's an increase being added to your life. Are you receiving it on good ground? I talked about that lesson. That's one of the reasons why you should be watching this videotape. You shouldn't be watching this for entertainment. You should be watching this so that you can grow in God. When I first got saved, and I'm getting back there now, I had such an excitement for the word. Anybody who was preaching, man, I wanted to be there. I wanted to hear it. I wanted to grow. 
any tool that, that, that I found out that can enhance my level of understanding, I purchase it. We got to get back to that because you'll never grow if you don't enhance your Bible study. If you don't enhance your selection of worship music. You should, you should move away from some things that may have give you motivation at first. Uh, but you should move to a level of worship. Your intimacy. Your level of prayer. Your level of, of, of dedication and commitment. Your consistency. You know, that's very key. You got to grow in God. You got to know how to give God praise in spite of. You got to know how to give God, how to worship him in spirit and in truth. And it doesn't matter what you're going through because in that spiritual place, you know how to be there. God wants to develop you. Are you growing? First thing. Second thing. Growth is when you begin to ask more questions than the answers you think you have. Anybody who have all the answers run from them. I'll say it again. Anybody who has all the answers run. For none of us have all the answers. The Holy Ghost is one who leads us and guides us into truth. So when we really know that you're growing is when you stop thinking you know everything. Matter of fact, there was a time in my life, and I'm still there, that God told me to get rid of everything that I thought I knew. Because he wanted to give me something fresh. He wanted to give me something new. He wanted to give me some, He wanted to give me revelatory knowledge. But sometimes I held God to what he said so I couldn't hear God and what he was saying. So you know God can be speaking to you at 12 o'clock. But he's also speaking to you at 12.03. Sometimes you locked in what he said at 12 o'clock. You miss what he's saying at 12.03. And it's very important that you understand what God is saying. So you got to get rid of some things. Growth is important when you, when you come to the realization that I know nothing. Without Christ, I am nothing. And I'm only what he tells me I am. And when he pours into me, that's all I have to say. That's growth. Growth is when you mature to the point that you don't have to always be right. You don't have to always have the answers. Matter of fact, as you grow, you're going to ask more questions. The Bible is full of questions. Even God asked ask questions. He said, Adam, where are you? That was a question. Who told you you were naked? That was a question. We got to begin to ask questions because you really don't know how to be a father. That's growth. You really don't know how to be a mother. That's growth. You really don't know how to pastor a church. That's growth. You really don't even know how to walk this thing that we call righteousness and holiness. And a lot of times we say a lot of things, be holy and be sanctified. And I preach it all the time. But you don't even know how to be that until God tells you. But you got to be in and ask God questions. You know how we grew in our understanding? Because we asked God, what is holiness, God? Is it really makeup? Is it really having on a, a, a long dress? Is it really that? What is sanctification, God? Is it staying home from the club? Well, even though I bring the club to my house, what is it? And you got to ask God some questions. What is a prophet and what is apostle? Not what people told me what it was. Not what my pastor may have preached about it. But I need a confirmation of it in my spirit. God revealed to me. And you got to begin to ask questions. Even considering your day, you don't even know what you're going to do tomorrow. And if you do know, who told you? What are you going to do tomorrow? Have you heard it from God? See, growth is when you come to the point that you come to God as, a, as an empty vessel. Saying, God, fill me. Fill me what you want me to have. And I accept that I don't have any knowledge of it. Only what you tell me. Even Jesus says, I only say what my father tell me to say. That's maturity. And you got to begin to ask questions. Because a lot of times you're not being developed in God's pathway because you think you already know it. See, religion sometimes puts a hold on God because we want to know where God was, but we don't know where God is. And we have to know where God is. And that's growth when you can admit, I don't know. It was growth for the man who said, God, don't help my belief, help my unbelief. That was growth to admit that. See, God was trying to get Peter to grow up. But, but Peter made a statement as if he knew some things. God, I'll follow you wherever you want me to go. And Jesus says, no, you won't. Matter of fact, before the chicken crows three times, you're going to deny me. You got to be able to accept where you are. You got to be able to accept that. And then when he came back after he denied him and Peter fishing and Jesus is on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the shore, he cooking fish and he gets over there and Jesus said to him, do you love me? And in the original translation, he says, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I, I fill those thee. He says, no, do you agape me? Feed my sheep. He said, Lord, you know I fill those thee. And then the last time he says, oh, do you fill those me? And he said, yes, Lord, I fill those thee. That's the correct language. See, in the, in the English language, it reads, do you love me? And it, it looked like God is asking the same question three times. But really, God is asking, can you be honest about where you are now? Can you admit? Because Peter had an ego. He had a pride. that He always had to know everything. He always had to be right. And even though God gave him revelation of who he was, there's some things in his character that need to grow. And he need to grow in being honest. 
And sometimes you can't grow because your ego can be a block to your growth. Pride can be a, a block to your growth. There are things that we call blood clots and it stops the blood from flowing. And a lot of times God's life wants to flow and develop you, but you have some blood clots in your life called ego, called pride. Called I gotta know everything, or called uh, immaturity, or called a uh, bitterness or unforgiveness, and you'll never be able to be developing the pathway in which God wants if you don't remove those things. So you have to be honest. And Peter, for the first time, was able to say, "God, I'm not at the level of agape yet, but I am at the at the level of philos, and it's very in key. And you must ask questions. God, am I where I think I am? Have I been deceived? Am I delusional? Do I think more highly of myself than I ought to think?" You really want growth? You got to be honest with yourself. You got to be able to ask questions about yourself. Am I too hard on myself? Am I too weak on myself? Uh, am I too selfish? Am I too critical? Am I too judgmental? You really want to grow in the things that God wants you to grow? You got to ask some questions about yourself. God, do I see things in a narrow way? Or do I see things in a practical way? God, do I see things in a religious way? There's some questions you got to ask God. And God must reveal those things to you. You'll never be able to grow if you're not honest about where you at. I told you, you it takes growth to say I'm lost. It takes growth to say I'm selfish. It takes growth to be able to say, you know what? There's some things about me that I don't love about God. And I'm honest there because the whole purpose of truth is to set you free. But you got to be free from the very thing that you're lying about. See, so if you really want to be developing a pathway of God, there's some questions that you must ask. And these are some hard questions. And a lot of times we don't want to see ourselves. A lot of times we don't want to see. We want to believe where we are is where we are. And sometimes we like being delusional because we fooled a lot of people. But I'm telling you, the, the key to growth is questions, not always having the answers. Growth. Very key. Third principle I want to talk about is God wants us to move to a level that we become trees. The Bible talks about we are a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Uh, when a blind man uh, was blind and, and God touched his eyes, he said, I see man as trees. Jesus comes along and he becomes the tree of life. You must be developed into becoming that tree. Now I'm taking my time and I'm trying to be um, um, as, 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 as calm as I can, even though I'm getting excited in my spirit. Um, there's a tree that God wants you to become and I want to teach on that. First of all, your whole purpose of a tree is to be able to weather all the storms of all the seasons and remain. The purpose of a tree is to be able to weather all the season. It doesn't have an option. It can't decide that I only want to stand when it's summer outside. But that tree must stand in the summer. It must stand in the winter. It must stand in the fall. It must stand in the, in the spring. It must stand when somebody comes along and lean on it. It must stand when a dog comes by and, and, and do what he do on it. If anything that may happen, that tree is designed to stand. And how can that tree stand? That tree has to be able to gather roots from underneath before it can have fruit from above. And we want to develop ourselves in becoming a tree, but you'll never be able to de be developing the pathway that God has called you to become a tree if you can't endure hell before you desire heaven. You got to conquer those things that are unseen. You got to be, be willing to be in a place where you're being used, but nobody knows your name. Nobody calls out your name. You're not bishop. You're not apostle. You're not prophet. You're not advanced. You're not pastor teacher, but you're working in the function, but you don't have the title. You're not being celebrated. You're not being appreciated, but you're being faithful to it because you know that you're being developed to become a tree and you got to conquer the things that are unseen. You got to be able to be silent. You got to be able to be overlooked. You even got to be able to be sometimes abused. The dirt, the dirt attacks the seed, I told you, in order for that thing that's in you to be able to, to bring forth. There are some attacks that's going on in your life that you have to be silent about. You are being attacked. You are being ostracized. You are being rejected. But you know without a doubt it's going to help you bear some roots in your life because you know that this attack is only to cause you to root up. But you will not root up. You will be committed. You will be loyal. You will stay there. Because you know without a doubt God is trying to develop you to become a tree. And even though you're very small right now, you're a seed and you look insignificant. And you seem to have no meaning and no value. You know within the power of that seed and the power of what God designed for you, there is a tree. And you're allowing it to go through. But you're conquering and you're searching for water. That root looks for water. And he's following the water because he wants to grow. And the deeper that root grows, the stronger that tree becomes and the more fruit that tree can bear. I'm telling you, you need to... Be to be desired and you need to, to desire to become a tree. That you're going to handle some things. Some dirt be on your life. You're not seen for years. You're not heard for years. No one knows about you. You know how to stay undercover because you're trying to grow some roots. 
You're handling some storms in your life to be quiet. And that's so important to becoming. God wants to develop you on a pathway to become a tree, but you have to endure. And can you endure that? I'm telling you, you can. I'm telling you, learn to be quiet. I'm telling you that sometimes your name won't be called. Sometimes they will never give you the appreciation that you deserve. But you know you're being developed to become a tree. That, that marriage that you went through was developing you to go to be a, come a tree. The ministry that you're in. The things that, the family that you were chosen. You say, why did my father do some things to me? Why did my mother seem to abandon me? Why am I always running into trouble? Because God is trying to build roots before you bear fruit. And you must understand that. And you want to become fruitful in God. So if you want to become fruitful in God, then learn to endure. Learn to endure. And God has taught us that. He says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Knowing this. Knowing this, what? What's going to happen? That something's going to bring forth. What's going to come forth? That the trial of your faith is going to work in patience. And patience is going to do something else. It's going to make God not ashamed or make you not ashamed. And it's very important that you don't abort that process in order for you not to become a tree. You have to say, I know what God said in my life. I will become fruitful because there are many people that's going to need what I'm going through. Many people have told me, I'm sorry for what you have been through, Jenkins, but your life has been sweet to me, even though it's been bitter to you. I I had to deal with some bitterness so when they take taste the fruit of what I went through that fruit is not bitter that fruit they're tasting is sweet because I endure it I endure it. now they can be blessed by my struggles and the anointing is on my life and on your life because we went through but guess what if I did not suffer the right way and did not understand what God was doing and didn't have the right attitude when I told them my story they would taste bitterness and a lot of times we're giving testimonies but your testimony tastes bitter I can taste the unforgiveness. I can taste the frustration because you don't know without a doubt that when you were going through, that was a purpose or a test to build you to become a strong tree. And because you didn't handle it right, you you end up uh, producing bitter fruit and not sweet. And we want to all taste and see that the Lord is good. We taste him through your experience. We taste him through what you have been through. Even God, when it came to Jesus, he said that it pleased him, that he bruised him. I'm telling you, God gives pleasure when he's trusting the suffering of the seed to produce a fruit, to produce a tree. And you must know that. And that's a development that's taking place in your life. And you must accept that. Very key. So you got to stand in all season, winter, summer, fall, spring. Not only that, you have to produce leaves and you also will produce fruit. You have to know that. You have to understand that the leaves are for the indication of the tree, but the fruits are for others. As much as that tree went through, as much as he had to deal with being rained on, sometimes it was very uh, hot outside and it scorched the tree. There's a lot of things that may happen to the tree. People ride by the tree, whatever the case may be. The trees may, may be neglected, but that tree endures all that it endures. And then it finally bears fruit. And guess what? Not one time do any apple on the apple tree benefits the tree. He doesn't eat his own apples, but he suffered for others. God is one of developers on the pathway that you don't mind going through for somebody else to be blessed. You don't mind being tried and in the fire so that other people can go out and see the divinity of God through your life. Because you know without a doubt that you're being developed to be a tree and you desire that. You want that. I want to be a blessing to others. I heard a story one time and it blessed me and I say it almost everywhere I go. I would love to, when, when I get to heaven, for some children to walk up and say, thank you. You are the reason why I'm here today. You told me about what God did for you. And I believe in it and accept it. And now that I'm saved. What a powerful testimony. Did you help others overcome? Or someone write you a letter and say, I was going through a divorce. I was going to lose my mind. But you told your story. How God delivered you and helped you. And didn't have any bitterness towards the person that left you or raped you or cheated on you. And because of that, I was able to handle my pain. See, you're called to be a tree to bear fruit. And be able to bless others from that. That is so important that you understand that. Or somebody say, you know what? I was going to kill somebody. But I heard your testimony. See, you, the reason why you're going through. In every circumstance of your life that you want to be bitter about. That you want to fuss about. You want to complain about. You thought it was unfair. You thought it was unjust. It was God was trying to build. He was trying to develop you on a pathway. So that other people can come by and benefit from your suffering. You benefit from Jesus. You have salvation and you say salvation is free. It wasn't free to him. It cost him his life. So why can't you lay your life down for someone else? That's the development. So you have to grow into that. You have to begin to ask questions. You have to begin to say, God, make me a tree for others to be blessed, for others to come by, for others to feel what I've been through and know without a doubt that God is a healer. God is a deliverer. 
God can sanctify you. God can keep you holy. Because that tree over there, I just tasted his fruit. I know God can do it. Very key point. Second thing I want to talk about is how you treat the hunger or the hungry, those who are hungry. How do you treat those? How do you treat beggars? This is very key to growth. It's very key to a pathway. God wants to put us on, on a pathway where people who would starving naturally, who have no house, who have no clothes, who have no shoes, who have never driven a car. There's some people who don't even have um, a vehicle to take their kids to school with. And God want to know, I want to put you on a path where it's going to help those. But how do you see those who are less fortunate than you? Do you look down on them? Do you think you're better than the next person? You come from the same situation, but ever since you've been blessed, you finally, you know, you got a husband that has a good job and was able to take you out in the projects. Now you look down on those who live in housing. Now you look down on those who are in welfare. Now you can't, you, you can't spend time with people who may still have roaches and rats. And I understand that they're bugs, but guess what? We had roaches and rats before. Can you help them get out of that situation? How do you see those who are less fortunate? When you see beggars on the street, do you are, are they irritant to you? Or are you praying and intercede for them? Okay, maybe you don't have enough money to give them, but have you prayed with them? When the last time they asked you for a quarter or for a dollar or for some change and you said, I don't have that, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee. We don't see any miracles anymore. Because do we care about the beggars who at the gate are beautiful, but they have an ugly disease? See, how you feel about that? I'm telling you that God want to use you on a certain pathway. He want to develop you. But how you see those, you'll never be able to help somebody in a struggle if you are already judgmental of those who have a struggle. Most of the struggle that you've been through is so that you can help somebody else. You've been through smoking so you can help somebody else put the cigarette down. You was raped. You can help somebody else overcome being raped. You was molested, you can help somebody else overcome being molested. You were forsaken, you had to raise yourself, you had to raise your four brothers, your five sisters, you can help somebody else overcome that. But how do you see those who have suffered? How do you look at the person who's less fortunate than you? How do you see those? And not only those in the natural who are hungry or who are starving, who don't have a place to live. See, we so blessed, you got me so many clothes in your closet. You can't even wear them all. You have clothes in your closet you haven't worn in three years. And you know people who only have two outfits. And you rather complain and fuss how they keep coming to church with the same clothes on rather than bless them with something that you don't even have room enough to receive. See how you see that person. You have extra money. You can buy extra bread. When the last time you went grocery shopping and thought about somebody else besides yourself? There's a pathway that God is trying to develop us on. We need to be able to help that. When they follow Jesus... To the point they got hungry. He created a miracle. He turned the two fishes and the five loaves of bread into a miracle. To the point they had seven baskets greater than what they started out with. Because he was concerned about those who were less fortunate. And we have to be concerned. We're not concerned anymore. And there's a pathway that God is trying to develop us to have a heart. That's why you went through some of the things. Because you know what it feels like not to have food. You know what it feels like not to have electricity and be in dark for three days waiting on them to cut on your electric again. You know what it feels like to not have cable. You know what it feels like. So if you know what it feels like, then why don't we have sympathy and empathy for other people that have been through? Have we become so blessed and highly favored? Have we become so spiritual minded? Are we so deep in God that we have lost those who need the deepness in God? Are we so in the heavenly place that we can even bless those who are still in the earthly grounds? Still in the low ground that don't even know that level. And not only in the natural, but even in the spiritual. What are you gonna, how do you feel about those who have an appetite for God? Are they irritating you because they want to grow? Sometimes you'd be surprised at the people who irritate us because they want more prayer or they want to be more sanctified. Now you have a problem with them because you haven't, you, because you, there's still some compromising in your spirit. So because you haven't sold out to God, you upset with those who do sell out. Who have a hunger. But the Bible says, who hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. Do we care about that? Because God is trying to develop us to move to that level. Did you, did you want God more and more? Are you hungry for God? I mean hungry for God. I mean without a doubt that you want more and more of God. And every time you learn something, you want to learn more. You empty yourself out because you want more of God. Not church. Not blessing your gift. Not enlarging your ministry. But enlarging your love for God. For the hungry. I'm, and it's sad to say, even I speak to the leaders. Do you care about those who really want to learn more and grow in God? 
and hungry for God. We can't put them on, you know, and it's, I'm just going to, I'm going I'm to I'm speak from my heart today. Um, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago, church shift for me. You know, I grew up in a church where we spent three or four hours in church. We were hungry for God. We spent time on the altar. People needed demons cast out. They stay in church all night to get that demon out. And then something shift. We didn't have that labor anymore. We didn't have that wanting the greater oil in our life. We didn't pray. We didn't fast. You don't even hear the word shut in. And if it's now it's on the calendar, we're going to do one shut in a year. The devil is a liar. We didn't move, but something shift 10, 15 years ago. All of a sudden, people didn't have a desire for go to heaven. They, and I blame a lot of it on this prosperity message that came across. It kind of blinded us to having a true intimacy with God. Not that God doesn't want us to be in prosper, but he wants us to prosper even as our soul prosper. We want to be, we want to have prosperity, but our soul has not grown. Our soul has not prospered. Our emotions are not greater towards God. Our intellect has not died to the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And our will has not been surrendered over to God. But we want, we've got a bigger house. we got a bigger car. we got a bigger bank account. But we don't have a bigger um, a, a life of prayer. We have a bigger life of dedication and commitment. We're not loyal to the widows. We're not helping those who 70 and 80 who have paved the way for us, who prayed us through in the church, who labored, who cast the demons out of us. Now they 70 and 80. We don't spend time with them. We don't call them. We don't visit them. We'll take the offering, but we don't make sure that where they are in God. Matter of fact, if they die, we don't even check and see with God that they die prematurely. Because just because they 70 and 80 does not mean their ministry is over. See, we got to get to that point. A shift came. A shift came in the church. And it bothered my spirit because when that shift came in the church, we started having church at 8 o'clock. The next church was at 9.15. And then we have another service at 9.15 and I was over at 10.30. So we didn't make time for that. So Because you know why? Because people wanted to go golfing. People didn't want to spend all day in church anymore. And we lost that hunger. For those who was hungry for God and wanted more God and wanted worship and wanted intimacy, they couldn't find it because we made used to be worship and intimacy. We made it a church service. And we had a time slot. And we made it so much that it was regimented to the point that the praise and worship team started at 9 o'clock and it was done at 9.15. And then at 9.15 you would give the announcements. And then at 9.20 the announcements is over. And then at 9.20 the choir would sing. And then after 9.20 from 9.25 the offering is over and, and, and then we're going to take an offering. The offering, offering got to be over by 9.30. It, it all depends if we want a lot of money we make the offering 30 minutes. And then we back to preaching and then the altar call and then we out. And that probably was too long. And we lost how to deal with those who wanted more of God. And now we are suffering because those who really want more of God is being labeled. They're too deep. They're crazy. They lost their mind. Uh, it don't take all of that. And we've lost some things because we don't know how to deal with those who hunger for God. When I was pastoring in my church, I used to do worship for two hours. And I can barely get people to come out. I'm being honest with you. All the revelation that God has given me, sometimes I would have one person in my church. There's times when it grew to 100, and there's times that it died down to three or four people. I've always been able to have musicians, so I would have a full band. But you know why? Because people didn't want that much level of God. They didn't want that much level of God. They don't want to worship God for two and a half hours, three hours. But they said, I want more of God. They would sing song, more of you, more of you. You know, they used to sing that song, you know, uh, Jesus is enough. I guess Jesus wasn't enough. And we love that, sing that song. You know, I give myself away, but only for 15 minutes, only for 10 minutes. And I found out they didn't want it. Then I'm going to preach for an hour or an hour and a half like I do now. People say, man, that's too much preaching. People can't comprehend that. But when you go home, you go comprehend three hours of a movie. See, we lost. So what do you do with those who want to get deeper in God, who wants to die? And then we have so many strongholds in the body of Christ. So now we have pornography strong. We have all kind of homosexuality, lesbian. We have all kind of different sins, lying. We have money taken over in the church. We got pride. We got ego taken over the church. We got lesbian taken over the church. And one of the reasons why, because those who are hungry for God, they quit, they, they, their thirst have been, been almost cut off. They're drying up. Because we don't know how to feed those who are hungry and thirst. So now they stronghold risen up again because the house was clean, but it was not occupied. And then you criticize the same person who used to be so on fire with God, but you helped put the fire out. We got to get back to knowing what to do. We need prayer um, times, not only in the house of God. Everything don't fall on the preacher. You can't blame everything on the church. Do you pray in a home? Do you have prayer service in your home? We got to get back to home Bible studies and home prayer. We got to get back to praying on the corner. We got to get back to evangelizing. We got to get back to it. We got to get back to people are hungry out there. And we have to feed them God and God and God and God and then God and then God and God. Those are hunger. Those who want to worship. Those who want to labor. 
And we, that's one of the things that God is trying to develop a pathway for to feed those that are hungry for God over and over again. That's so key. And you're never going to be able to walk the pathway that God has called for you if you don't have the hunger in which God desired for you to have. We got to get back to desiring God more than anything. Desiring God. Next thing I want to talk about is how do you treat those that are thirsty? See, we got to be ready. We got to ready to feed those and, and give those the, wor the, the word of God and the water of God, which is the word of God. People are thirsty for God. But we have we can't replace thirst for God with entertainment. We can't replace thirst from God with, 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 with musical instruments or with your gift or with your car. I said a thirst for God. See, this is something God is trying to develop in our life to have a thirst for God. We got a thirst for gators. We got a thirst for a large church. We got a thirst for the wrong things. Our things are tied to the carnal. The Bible said, don't set your affections on, on earth. No, you're supposed to sit in heavenly places. You think should be on the desires of God. And that's something that God is trying to, trying to develop in our lives. But we get caught up in this entertainment. I'm not, and I'm not trying to criticize something, but BT, uh, is gospel BT is not enough for your thirst. Your spirit longs for God. What you trying to feel with a man, what you trying to feel with a woman, what you trying to feel with cars and working yourself and having a big account is supposed to come from God. God is supposed, and you, those things are substitutes and they're never bringing fulfillment in your life. Cause you got a hunger and thirst for the Lord. God is trying to develop a thirst and don't try to, don't try to, um, 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 Stop what God is doing in your life. Don't quench the thirst for Him. That's what's waking you up in the morning. That's why you're not happy. It's not a, you don't need another suit. You don't need another pair of shoes. You don't need to enlarge the house. You don't need another car. You need a greater intimacy with God. We got to get there. That's so key. He's trying to develop that. How you deal with those that are thirsty? And do and, and are you are you uh, critical of people who all they want to talk about is God? See, there's another thing. We don't know how to deal with those who are thirsty. So we say they're radical. We say, man, it don't take all that. They got to learn how to live life. There is no life outside of Christ. Christ is our life. Very key. See, we don't even know how to deal with those that are thirsty. So we, we, so we shun those. We don't call those over. Your best friends are probably people who are not deeper than you and God. See, you got to get back to that. We want to have real friendship. You need to be around somebody who's going to help quench your thirst. It's going to come over and want to pray. It's going to come over and want to study. Well, not come up when you have marital problems. Not come up with the opinion. But let's get in the word and see what the word says concerning your marriage. Let's see what the word says. See, what are we going to do with the thirst? Because God is trying to develop that. That's a pathway that God wants to put us on. Um, how do you deal with those that are naked? I told you, those who don't have uh, um, natural clothes and those who don't have spiritual clothes. Can you handle those that are naked? Can you handle those who have been exposed? See, another thing God is trying to develop us on. Because we don't know how to deal with people once they've been caught in their sin, once they've been exposed. Okay, they naked, but can you still love them? Can you feed them? Can you clothe them? That's very key. There's a scripture in the Bible. He says, God, I didn't know that you come to me. He said, yeah, I came to you. But when I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. God is trying to put us on a pathway to know how to deal with people who are naked, who've been exposed. They may have issues. But they still God's chosen. You are. You have an issue. And not only spiritually, but naturally. I'm telling you, God is trying to move us to a place that don't quit going to the store and only buying clothes for yourself. You thank God you went to the store and they had a sale, a, a three for ten. Then buy six. And don't let all the six be your size. You should know some of the people that you label with in church. You should know they wear extra large or they wear large. You should begin to buy clothes for others. We are here to close those. There should be a time when you when you pack a bunch of clothes in a trash bag or in a nice box or wrap it up and even though it ain't Christmas and take it to the homeless and say, you know what, every time I come to this store, you usually here and you ask for a dollar. The day I want to bless you with a jacket. I notice you have the same shirt and even though you're out here, you don't have a place to stay. You don't have to be cold out here anymore. See, cause we have, we, I'm telling you, God is trying. See, we think we think this life is only about going to church and giving God praise and speaking in tongues and shouting. No, I'm telling you, this thing is about how you treat the homeless, how you treat the widows. When the last time you went to the nursing home and prayed for them, you just believe in your heart you have a prayer ministry, but you can't wait to pray at the convention. But you don't want to pray at the nursing home. See, you want ministry, you want to preach on youth Sunday, but you don't want to preach on the corner where the gangs are. 
I'm telling you, God is trying to build a pathway, a godly pathway, and that godly pathway is concerned about those that are naked, concerned about those that are hungry, concerned about those that are thirsty, concerned about those who have been abandoned. See, we need an outreach ministry, but we want to outreach. We want to go out with the balloons and the horns and the whole praise team and be seen. No, you really want to evangelize? You know what some crack houses are. You know where they buy drugs at. You always say no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Or why you never go to a place where those where those weapons can be tested? Why you never go to a place where we can see where you could be in harm's way? Jesus put himself in harm's way. See, we need to be led. That's the pathway God is trying to lead us to. But we, we say that we know the, no weapon formed against us. We say if God be for you, he's more than the whole world against you. But the first time you got talked about, you quit. Very key. God is trying to lead us to that. How you deal with the sick? You may have a mother who's sick. You may have a grandmother sick. Do you pray with the sick? Do you encourage the sick? Do you know how to lay hands on the sick? Don't tell me you've been in God 10 years and you don't know how to take no oil. Know that it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit to bring their level of consciousness to a certain place. And when you pray to them, you know you're praying with confidence that God is going to heal them. Trusting for the will of God to be done and you're able to hear the will of God for their life. That's very key. Because there's so many sick people who need to be prayed for. It's sad to say that we hear more about ministries, large ministries, TV ministries. Everybody want to be on BET now. We hear more about their Mercedes. We hear more about their, their cars and their houses. When last time they put something on BET showing us uh, preachers going to the hospital, laying hands on the sick. Why don't they put that on BET? Why don't they put real ministry on BET? I don't want to see another ministry on TV where you're showing me his house, but you're not showing me his work. See, we got to pray for the sick. Hospital is full of sick people who getting addicted to medicine, who believe in that, 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 that the disease is final, and we have the power of the prayer in our mouth. We say we want to be used by God, but really all we want to do is preach on BET. All we want to do is, is hope that we get heard and somebody read our book. So, because really it's after money, but real ministry is being concerned about those that are sick. And not only those that are physically sick, but those that are spiritually sick. We got some sick preachers in our house. We got some sick apostles, sick prophets. They're consciously, they're sick to the point they think that that's their people. They think this is my church and I own it. See, there's some sick consciousness that's went on. The enemy has come in and infiltrated the enemy. And we need to pray for those. Not get on TV and try to kill them. Not expose everything about them, but know how to cover their nakedness like Noah's sons did and walk backwards and cover their father's nakedness. Even though he on the boat and he drunk, it's the only thing that, 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 that was saved. So we got to thank God for that. We got to know how to do that. Can you deal with the sick? God is trying to develop us into a pathway in order to handle the next time a preacher calls you or next time he's exposed. We should get together and call a prayer. Don't tell me when 9-11 came and all the people died in that tower, people got together and prayed. But when you heard about so-and-so on BT and he fell or cheated on his wife or he had a baby out of, out, 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 out of wedlock or whatever the case may be or he got caught up in homosexuality, why don't you call a prayer session for that? We can get together for 9 for the world, but we can't get together for the saints, those who are part of the body of Christ. God is trying to develop these things. This is real development. See, and we didn't heard so much about prosperity and we forget about the purpose in which God calls us. God said, I came to, I didn't come to save the saved. I come to save the lost. And you can be lost as a son. The prodigal son was lost. He said, this is my son who was lost. And we need to be concerned about those that are physically sick and those that are spiritually sick. We have the power. We love to say, I have the power in Jesus' name. I can cast a demon out in Jesus' name. There's a whole lot of demons in a whole lot of hospitals. Waiting on you. Are you concerned? Are you concerned? It's so important. With those who've been a victims of injustice. God is trying to get us to stand up. I'm not talking about becoming a politician. I'm talking about becoming a preacher. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. The police officers need to hear good news. I'm talking about injustice because they don't know Jesus. We need to preach Jesus for those who are victim of injustice. And we can't bring up liberty and justice and think justice is 2 plus 2 equals 4. I'm telling you the only real justice is Jesus Christ laying down his life. And you must accept Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior. He the only person that can teach you how to love your enemies. You, you always abuse your enemies because you don't know how to love them because you don't have the power to love because you don't have Jesus Christ. And we got to be concerned about those who are victim of injustice. Regardless on what hand that is in, our job is to become the salt of the earth. And God is trying to develop us. That's why you've been through. 
That's why you can handle some things. And it's your job to stand up when it's time to stand up. I also put here, and I'm just dealing with things that God has given me that we need to develop in the pathway in which we, God wants us to go. I put here, we got to get past loving man more than we love God. God, this is so heavy. Loving man, but rejecting God's love. I want to talk to the people who say, I'm alone. I don't have nobody in my life. Don't nobody really care. You're looking for a man to love you. God wakes you up every morning. God blesses you to breathe every morning. God constantly allows you any trouble that you can talk about. You've been in or you are in. You're still alive. If you can complain about it, you can praise him about it. If you can complain about it, you can praise him through it. Why would you believe that you need man's love, but God's love is surrounded around you and you won't receive it? Why does man approval gives you a fulfillment when God's approval doesn't? See, we got to be developed because we're being controlled by outside influences and not by inside convictions. I'm telling you, you, you have the greater level of your life. The greatest level of your life is God. I'm telling you, you've always been loved. I'm telling you that God said, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased. And God loves you because of who you are, not because of what you did. God would never allow your behavior to identify or to, uh, or to uh, counteract the identity he called you. You will be his son even if you're lost. You will be his son even if you're dead to some things. So I'm telling you, quit allowing man to give you affirmation and accept the love that, are, that surrounds you every day. You are alive for a reason. No one can come through all the things you have come through and not have purpose. You cannot, I keep telling you, a professional thief would never rob a bag lady. She don't have enough Jews. If the devil is coming to your life this much, don't you know he sees something you don't see? When are you going to start valuing the strength that you had above the struggle? When are you going to start uh, giving value to that you can be raped and still have a smile on your face? When are you going to start giving some credit to that even though there was no father in your life, you're able to help others know how to be a, uh, how to be a father? That those lessons taught you something. We got to start accepting the love of God that is in our life every day. So important. We got to be developed in his love, in his affirmation, in his giving us the identity. So important. I want to get through all of these, so I'm kind of moving fast, but I want you to hear those. Um, another thing that we have to be developing, and we got to stop um, committing spiritual suicide. Stop committing spiritual suicide. There are some things that you knew bring, or you know, or you knew will bring death to the level of relationship or fellowship that you and God was walking and you did it anyway. See, stop committing suicide. You know that those thinking, those thoughts is going to bring death to some things. You know entering into some of those boundaries is going to bring death to some things. So why would you kill yourself in that area? You're trying to grow. I told you God is trying to develop us to become mature. You're trying to grow. Don't kill yourself like Adam committed spiritual suicide when God said, if you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. And then he ate the tree, so he got disconnected from God. When God sets up a level of obedience in your life and you disobey God, that's called spiritual suicide. Because you knew that that was going to bring you separate. That was going to bring you down from a level in which you walk. Enoch walked with God until he did not, the Bible said he was translated. The Bible said he did not see death. It didn't say death didn't come. Death came, but he didn't see it because he was in another spiritual level. I'm telling you, you got to walk with God until you don't see certain things. But you keep committing suicide, killing yourself, and wondering why you're backsliding or find yourself relapsing or find yourself in the same struggle again that you knew God uh, had delivered you from. The Bible talks about, would you put yourself back in bondage again? After you have been adopted into the family of God, why would you bring yourself back into a bondage again? To the, to the spirit of fear. I'm telling you because you keep committing suicide. There's some things that God has established in our life and you got to say, I will never do that again. You got to say, I know you people say, you should never say what you were never going to do. Why shouldn't you say it? God has given you the power to some things and you got to declare it until it becomes so. You got to declare it until it becomes so. You want to be able to be like your father, Jesus, who's able to look at the devil in the face and say, there's none of you in me. 
You can't keep killing your spirituality. You can't keep pulling yourself from something. Look, if a star pulls itself out or falls from the sky, it dies. If a tree uproots itself or is pulled out from the ground, it dies. If a fish is pulled out of water, it dies. Why do you believe you can be put in God and then pulled out of God and still live? Now, the tree don't have the power to pull itself out. But you do because you have a will. And don't pull yourself out of the very source, out of the level of consciousness that's going to bring you to a level in God. You're committing suicide. You're killing yourself. And every single day you keep doing something that stops you from moving to a level in God. So now you're dead to that. And then you find yourself, that's why you're able to cuss. That's why you're able to slip back into some things. That's why you're able to, all of a sudden now, you're lusting again. All of a sudden now, pornography is becoming tempting to you again. All of a sudden now, you're starting to be bitter, starting to be judgmental because you killed some things, some nervous systems, some alarm system, you disconnected some lights that were flashing, say don't go, don't do it, don't do it, you did it anyway, and now you desensitize, so even when God is trying to deal with you, you have walked so far away, you, it's, bare, it's hard for you to even hear his voice, I'm telling you, you're committing spiritual suicide, and you'll never be able to walk and be developing the place or the pathway in which God wants you to, if you keep killing the thing that God is trying to water, God is trying to feed, God is trying to mature, you got to stop. You got to see the value of your purpose. You got to see what's needed. When I was struggling with suicide, natural suicide, and I remember after I had got my stomach pumped, and one of the ladies from the church came who loved my ministry, who was blessed by my ministry, she said something to me very powerful. She says, Jenkins, if you don't want to live for you, live for me. I need you. You have blessed me. I would have never got through my divorce if it wouldn't have been for you. I would have never been able to be the mother that I am for my children if it wasn't for you. And now you don't want to live? She said, if you can't find a reason to live for yourself, find a reason to live for me. For the people who, who for the word that's in your mouth that's supposed to bless others. She, says, she said, not only did you try to commit suicide, she said, you were selfish in your attempt. You didn't consider no one that you could touch. You didn't consider no one that you could help. All you thought about was yourself. The spirit of suicide makes you isolate every person you can help. Every need of the body of Christ, you now are blinded by your, like you're the only one that went through. Like you're the only one that had a bad marriage. Like you're the only one that had a bad childhood. Like you're the only one that have cable due. Like you're the only one that seemed to have, not have no food in the refrigerator. Like you're the only one that seemed not to be understood. You, you, you became your own idol in your own pain. And I'm telling you, you got to stop it. I'm telling you, you got to be able to open your eyes and see that you have value not only to yourself, but to others. Anytime a seed is planted in the ground, there's so many fruit that's supposed to come out of it. What is the nation you were supposed to feed? Who were the people you were supposed to help stop steps? You were supposed to be their lifeguard and stop them from drowning. What child was you supposed to bring into manhood? That because you want to commit spiritual suicide or even natural suicide. You can, you can commit suicide by saying things, I'll never be nothing. You just committing suicide. You can commit suicide by saying, I'll never come out of this. You just committed suicide. You're going against the very power that's in you. You should never attach anything negative to the I am. The I am is the power source in which we live. When God revealed himself, he says, who do you say that I am? He says, I am that I am. Moses said, who, who should I say send me? He says, the I am that I am is the I am of God. Everything that comes behind the I am should be positive. When you say, I am weak, you just empowered weakness. And when you only think about yourself from that perspective, you're flipping it. Suicide is turning on yourself or turning on God by your own power. That's what it is. You're trying to abort everything he has spoken, everything that he has promised, everything he has planted. And I'm telling you, it's a trick of the enemy. And so many, and I feel it in my spirit even though I'm speaking, there's so many saints who the spirit of suicide is coming to you because the pressure is so close. And I'm telling you, the purpose of your pressure is to develop you into a pathway God is calling you. Don't let the pressure of the enemy trying to tempt you in the wilderness stop you from getting to verse 18. Verse 18 said, for the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. They set the captives free. Open the blinded eyes. But you got to be able to endure. But now the enemy is using that pressure and you're thinking about killing yourself. You're thinking about quitting on the ministry. You're thinking about not staying faithful to the wife. You're thinking about walking out the family. 
You're thinking about stop doing some things God has assigned to your life. And I'm telling you, you can't. I'm telling you, no. Don't. Please don't. I'm begging you. I'm beseeching you. I, I, I'm beseeching. I, I, like Paul said, I beseech you, my brother. I, I'm, I'm coming to you. We got to stop it. You will never be able to be. And I'm telling you, the devil is alive. I come against any spirit right now, any principalities, any power as I'm speaking to you. I come against it. I cast it down right now. I release light into your home, into your house, into your heart. Right now, in the name of Jesus, you will not give up. You will not quit. You will not die. I speak it. You will not take those pills. You will not, you will not use that gun. You will not walk out. You will not do it. You, are, you have purpose. You have meaning. You have value. You have a word in your mouth. You're only being attacked because you've been called to carry the ball. I speak to it right now in the name of Jesus. You must understand that God is trying to develop us into a certain pathway. And you got to understand what God is trying to do. Um, let me stop there. I'm going to stop there. I feel the power of God. And I'm going to stop there. So I speak for all those. And I'm going to go over those quickly. If you're just now getting on, I'm going to run down the list very key. God is trying to develop in the pathway. The first thing is God won't grow for your life. God wants you to move past the ABCs. He wants you to grow up. If you're in the third grade, God wants to move you to the fourth. If you're in the seventh grade, God wants to move you to the, to the eighth. And the only way you're going to be able to grow, you got to accept some things. You got to begin to ask questions. You got to be honest with yourself. You got to be honest and say, God, am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I in line with you? Am I in the right place? Am I in the right city? Do I think the right thoughts? Do I have the right emotion concerning my afflictions? Do, do I have the right attitude towards you? You got to begin to ask some questions. God, am I too holy? Am I too critical? God, do I not trust you enough? You want to grow, you got to ask some, some questions. Very key. You got to become a tree. You got to know that. You got to know your whole job is to suffer some things unseen so that you can grow some fruit that will be seen. They may not never see the roots, but they'll see the fruit. And you must understand that. So you got to suffer. And if you never learn how to conquer your hell, you'll never learn how to enjoy your heavens. You got to know how to search for water. Roots search for waters. You got to say without a shadow of a doubt, my ministry may be small right now. My ideas may be small right now, but I know I'm called to be a tree. And you can't be jealous when God blesses you to become a tree because you're not eating none of those apples. Those apples, are the tree never benefits from the apple. His enjoyment is giving birth to fruit. You got to say, God, you can use me. They never call my name. They never call me a bishop. They never say I'm the one who did it. I don't mind driving a car. I don't mind showing up. I don't mind help raising somebody else's kids. I don't mind telling my story because I know I'm a tree. My job is to bear fruit so others may come by and be blessed by my storm and my story. You are a tree. You got to know that. You got to know how to treat those that are hungry. Those that are hungry in the natural and those that are hungry in the spiritual. You got to know how to feed those that are, or give thirst to those that are thirsty. How to deal with the naked. How to deal with the injustice. How to deal with sickness. How to deal with that. Very key. God is trying to develop us. You're called to cover some people. Yeah, you're called to cover some people. You may never be Apostle Paul, but you're called to be Barnabas. You got to understand that. And you, you don't have no problem with being Barnabas. You don't mind being the second man in charge. So key. So key, so key to life. You, you don't have to be Neo, you're Morpheus. And you must understand that it's so important. You have a desire after those who are older. We got to start taking care of the widows. We got too many people who have labored in God 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, and now they're 70. We don't even care about them. We don't even care about them. They can send their money and that's all we care about. We got to begin to take care of our elders. Those are in the senior, senior uh, citizen homes. Those are in the nursing home. We got to be concerned about the homeless. Yeah, we got to be concerned about the home. Put some stuff in your car and go to the place where you know they're begging for money and give them something. Be a blessing. And if you don't have any money, you don't have any clothes, write some words of encouragement down. God bless me. I just write down things. I put it in envelopes and I lay it places. I, I put on the envelope a gift for you. Begin to pass off things. God is love. And lay it down when you go to McDonald's. Lay, lay, lay something down. Write something in your heart and pass it to somebody. Call somebody who got five and six kids. You know they're struggling. And tell them, I, I'll take three of your kids today. I know you need a break. See, we got to be concerned. God is trying to develop us to another level of ministry. So important. I wish you could hear this. So important. Make sure that you, your love of God is received more than your love for man. I'm telling you, if I had to name the biggest struggle that Robert Jenkins ever had, it was I got blinded by my supposedly need to be loved 
that I couldn't even enjoy the love that was in front of me. You must accept every person that God has put in front of you. Those that God has caused to help you. And know how to know that it's God. See, sometimes we think it's people. That's God speaking through you. That's God trying to use you. That's God trying to hug on you. And you got to be able to receive that love from God. Not necessarily from man, but from God. If you get it from man, great. Thank God for it. God, God will use men. But you want to make sure that he's your first love. It's a sad thing when you read the book of Revelation and he names all the things that this church did. He says, but the one thing you have, you have forsaken, you have lost your first love. Are you in love with God more than you love with anything? Do you hunger and thirst for God? That's another thing I talked about. Those who are hungry and thirst for God. I'm praying for a real revival to take place. I'm praying for a move of God that we get back to five and six and seven, eight hours of worship. I'm a, I'm, I got to stop. But God put some things on my spirit I'm going to share with you. I, God gave me a vision at midnight. See, we want to talk about the drugs. We want to talk about the alcohol. We want to talk about the gangs. We want to talk about the bars. Do you know there's some things that God is calling the saints to do at midnight that you're not doing? You wonder why you can't sleep, but you won't get up and pray. God told me years ago that he wanted me to put together a prophetic, a, a prophetic band. Nothing but Levites. At midnight, we pray and we play. We have prayer warriors to walk around that area and all they do is pray. That's all they do is pray. Casting down darkness, casting down demons, casting down spirits of lust, casting it all down. Casting down false imaginations. And he says, while they're praying, have a prophetic band that's doing no, no singing. If it is singing, it'll be prophetic songs. We won't be singing nobody else's song. The song that God put on our spirit right now. And play into the atmosphere. Prophetic worship. Horns, trumpets, drums, keyboards, sax, flutes, uh, turgical dancers, and in the atmosphere. This is attack against the atmosphere of darkness. See, we're called to do that. It's another level of God trying to develop us. The reason why God is giving you a certain sound and certain dreams and certain aspirations, certain ideas, because what God is trying to bring into the earth. But you have to allow God to develop this pathway that God is calling you. And it may, it may not fit into the church circle. Everybody's not going to understand you. But you got to know without a doubt that you have value and meaning to the purpose and the kingdom of God. We're supposed to be doing that. We're supposed to be attacking the airways. We really, see, I, we, we love the quote, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Then why are you fighting it? Why are you attacking people? Let's deal with the demons and principalities, imaginations. Let's attack the airways. Let's, let's lift a prophetic sound that changes the world. Changes the world. You watch the first movie, and I'm going to stop here. Ghostbusters. They was trying to kill all the ghosts, and they found out they couldn't do it. And they were trying to do it individually or even as a team. At the end of the first Ghostbusters, all the people come together to a city, and they begin to sing a song. And when they be unified in this song, they was able to destroy the demons. We'll never be able to move in the level God wants to develop because we don't know how to become one in worship, one in intimacy, and one in love for mankind. We gotta care about what God is doing in the earth. Yes, you've been blessed and you've been highly favored. Have you blessed somebody since? Are you still looking to be blessed or have you become a blessing? So I'm gonna stop here. This is Robert Jenkins. Remember, this is the place where purpose is revealed, passion is renewed, and the power of God and the principles of God are restored. God bless you. God is trying to develop us into a new pathway. Receive it. Go over those, and I think it was seven principles. Go over those seven, and if God say the same, I'll finish the other 13 that's left. God bless you, and have a great night.